Look, this must be one of my favorite times on a Sunday night. I hope it is yours as well. Why? Because we get to engage with you on issues that matter to you and matter to your community. Tonight, we are discussing violence in schools and what are some of the solutions in order to put paid to violence in schools? Why are we discussing it? Well, for one, it matters. And two, it's topical. Hey, very good evening to you, South Africa and those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman and this is It's Topical. Let's welcome our central voice to the program, our digital audiences here. Good to have them on the program tonight. And just a reminder to our new viewers, they are based, uh, sourced on their interactions with us during the week on the topic of the week. And as always, digital audience, if you have any burning questions, please raise your virtual hand. But just a reminder that we have limited time, so might not get to everybody. So let's get those hands up early enough so that we don't leave it till the end of the program where we're pretty tight on time. Disturbing videos portraying violence in school settings. It's circulating on social media, you've probably seen it. Physical fights on school property. How do we stop this type of behavior? How do we prevent these types of violent acts. But in order to do that, we must first understand and address the risk factors at various levels. The learner, the teacher, as well as the community at large. That is what we will be doing tonight. Problems and solutions, which leads us to our question of the week. And we're asking you, how can we root out the ongoing display of violence among learners in South African schools? That's our question tonight. Please engage with us at It's Topical SABC. Walk with me while we get ready for the roundup. We have to have a, one would say, a comprehensive approach to safety in schools. How better can we understand the situation in order to put paid to it? That is what we will be doing tonight. But first, time for your roundup. Look, it's the big story we all woke up to this morning. ESCOM ramping up rolling blackouts to stage six. And in a media briefing earlier this morning, the power utility could not confirm any set timelines on when stage six would be downgraded. ESCOM has warned that electricity consumers could face another week of extensive regular power cuts after generation units tripped at Kusile as well as Creel Power Station overnight. Here's the ESCOM's Chief Operating Op Officer, Jan Oberholzer, detailing for us uh, what he means by this. I had a call from the system operator um, saying, you know, we're still running uh, open cycle gas turbines. Our water is extremely low. And so over and above that, we had trips of additional units this morning. And we then had to make a, a urgent uh, call uh, to implement uh, stage six, so to lift the level from five up to six. So this is to deal with the fact that um, our emergencies, as Andre has said, and as well as I've said a few times now, to make sure that we don't deplete it at all. Because should you deplete your emergencies and the system is really in need for those and you do not have it, there's a catastrophe that will happen. We're running with units at risk, of which four of these, just under two gigawatt, are running at high risk. So looking ahead, stage six load shedding will remain implemented until sufficient generating units are returned to service and the emergency reserves levels have been replenished. Now, we are not yet able to make a firm commitment as to when we will be able to ease the current stage of load shedding. Mr. Oberholzer there. You've learned today as well that President Cyril Ramaphosa has abandoned his second leg of his United States trip where he was to attend the United Nations General Council meeting. He will now return to the country in order to deal with the stage six rolling blackouts following the funeral of Britain's Queen Elizabeth II on Monday. That's tomorrow. So we understand that this is an issue many regarded as a crisis, but 
the SABC has you covered. Uh, in order to resolve this, you need to get this app, download this app. Uh, you can go to the Apple Store as well as Google Play, download it. If you get hit with load shedding now, you can switch on this app and you can watch it anywhere in the world. Pretty nifty to have this app indeed. Please go and download it. Uh, all right, let's, let's take you to this story now. In other news, in the past week, trending stories, advocate Melissa Letefo was struck off the roll by the High Court in Pretoria for the improper conduct and theft of clients' money, we understand. And have a look at this. You remember, we had him on the program uh, a couple of months ago, and this is what he was saying it has the High Court actually says that Tefo has no regard for the justice system and is not fit and proper to continue practicing as an advocate. The High Court says the removal of his name from the role of legal practitioners is justified. This was back in July, just after Tefo withdrew from the Senzo Miwa case. Uh, on this program, it's topical. We had him on and as you can see, there we go. It's pretty popular in terms of the views. He's a pretty popular character, over 159,000 views in that. So this was that story that was we were talking about this evening. All right, I want to talk to you more now about what we, the main topic of today. And we want to talk to you about the, the issue of violence in schools. What is the next question? It is a bit scary. Who is next? Could it be another learner, a teacher, or a principal? This is but just one question some social workers are asking. One of them told its topical co-producer, Mahi Ketramotlape, that violence has become a daily occurrence in Alexandra, north of Johannesburg. And this after a learner was stabbed with a pair of scissors two weeks ago. And barely a week later, a deputy principal also became a victim of the stabbing. Take a look. An Alex Polosho Secondary School infested with violence mid last week. A grade 8 learner stabbed with a pair of scissors and his name written on the chalkboard for everyone to see. He had to be rushed to a nearby clinic and later transferred to a hospital for further medical attention. He was discharged within a week. We're not sure on what might have spiked the, the, the fight or the stabbing. The child was then taken to the police station uh, in the presence of the parents. And it means then police are also investigating this matter. On that Wednesday morning, the violence prompted searches by police. Dacha and sharp objects, including knives, confiscated. We can confirm that uh, this is not the first incident uh, which occurred in and around that uh, school, uh, which is quite concerning because what you are saying as a department, our partnership with parents is quite key in instilling discipline in our children. For every learner here, it's an all too familiar story, but it's a question of whose blood is next. Elizabeth Mugwena is a social worker manager at the nearby Alexander Police Station's Kids Clinic. She has helped counsel both the teenage perpetrators and victims. This month only we had like uh, 39 files for kids only, those who are coming to, 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 to attend the social workers. Always happen because some, if you ask them, maybe sitting with them, talking to them, they will tell you, it's because of you as bullying me. So now I thought to, to fight back, I might just bring whatever I brought home and then hit him or stab him because I was protecting myself. Those hired to help prepare their future are not spared either. Just this past Wednesday, a Real Ojila High School deputy principal was stabbed with a pair of scissors, allegedly by a grade 11 learner who had been summoned to the office for misconduct. In solidarity with the victim who has since been discharged from a medical facility, learners staged a protest, removing others from their glass room to join them in Alex's streets. 
but theirs was a cry for help amid safety concerns at school. Both alleged perpetrators at Polosho and Realohile secondary schools have since been suspended amid disciplinary processes. It's a daily thing happening at school. There's violence of school. If they are not uh, smoking dacha, they are beating each other. But last year, the bigger problem that we had is this gangsterism. We had gangsterism of the schools. You'll see maybe Polosho have their own gang their own gang. And the gang, there's boys also who have their own and there's girls also. For Mukwena, it's a deep-rooted problem in our society. Maybe you'll find out at home the domestic violence is uh, there now. He thinks that is a good thing to do. Now he'll practice it to other kids. Or if they don't see it at home, maybe the father is not there, maybe the father is staying somewhere else, then the child starting to get an anger or how I do have a father but now He's staying somewhere else and what about me? He's not attending me. Oh, my mother is not here. I'm with my grandmother. So the child will start behaving the other way around. From Alex, Realohile and Polosho High Schools stepping and Begastal Simonia Secondary School fist fight to the Peter Marisbeck North Berry Secondary School petrol bombing and a gun chasing incident in a Northwest school. A cry for help, a cry for safety. All in need of urgent solution to help secure a future free of violence. For its topical, Amari Gedamutabe, SABC News, Alexandra, north of Johannesburg. Mark, thank you very much indeed. As always on this program, I'd like to give you context, I'd like to give you perspective. Let me give you some quick facts on violence in South African schools, the, the prevalence, the types of violence, as well as the hotspots where violence actually occurs. Have a look at this. Now, this talks with regard to the prevalence of schools, uh, school violence in South Africa. I want to have you to have a look at this number. 22% of learners have been victims. It doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when in, in the scheme of things, in the context of what children are actually going through, that is a lot. The majority is learner-on-learner -learner violence, and the same learners may be both victims and perpetrators. What does that mean? I'm going to bring in the better mind and discuss this a little further. Take a look at this now. This talks to the type of school violence. And here we're talking about the threats of violence, the psychological abuse, obviously robbery, physical assault, gang violence, corporal punishment, illegal in South Africa, but does it continue in South Africa? I'll get you some answers as well. And then just finally, with regards to the hotspots in schools, in the classroom, when educators are unable to manage the class, when the class is left without uh, supervision, and then when at school sports grounds, school toilets, on their way to and from school. So that basically gives you an idea of what we're dealing about tonight and how can we better improve the situation? Where are the loopholes? Where are the gray areas that we can get into in order to stop this situation currently? This program is nothing without your voice. So let's hear what you have to say on tonight's topic. The word on the street feature comes to you from the streets of Alexandra. This is what you had to say. I think the government are uh, like more security or even sometimes when I'm a police like SAPS because sometimes abantana 
otherwise situation a you cannot leave it to the pork to the cops to come and help us because if I'm not keep a number of parents should play a big role because of charity begins at home the parents should teach their children discipline morals ethics and all fundamental things that children need to be taught so that when they arrive at school they can become proper learners and manage to engage with other learners without without any violence Tinabazali is part of our billion dollar. Because we sum down our school and our sum down our cut to feel it. Okay, now we are right now. You wish a bank of Bandwa na betu. Bank of Hamba Mlandu. No, we took away from the school and agwe anga gugulio. Agwe anga upemi drugs. Agwe anga shallow ma toilet. Bazali sum na masum na tisa ne no teacher. We are Bandwa na betu bas cut. Your views helps us shape the strategy helps us get to that better place. I want to bring in my colleague Clela Mkuko and video journalist Lipo Selele, who are in Easteris in the east of Pretoria, uh, where she is with a family whose child has experienced bullying and violence in schools. Clela, good to have you on the program. Very good evening to you. I understand that uh, where you are, they're currently having load shedding, so the signal might be not the best. But let's try to get a sense of what this family is going through Shlel. All right, as I said, Murphy's law. Yeah, when I were in Esther. All right, go on, go on, Shlel. Um, and we are here to talk about the plight of the children that are being violated in school, uh, allegedly um, by the entire Himalayan area. Uh, but we have parents, two parents here, who are going to take us through the experiences of these children at school and how has it affected their lives at home and at school. So we welcome two parents here, but I need to let the viewers know that we are going to be clearing their, their faces because we, we are protecting both the children and the families of the children. Let's go straight into this place. Um, welcome, sir. Please take us through what happened to your grandson. Yeah, my grandson was three was a day. She went to go to the school, and then when he passed the school, the other school, uh, two schools, the high school. So when he passed the school, the guy swear and it's So I think we have to go to the All right. Look, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of that crossing, load shedding taking a toll on our broadcast tonight. But remember, this is the app that you need to download where you can watch us wherever you are around the world. We'll try to get back to Tlela uh, in a short while, talking to parents who are experiencing the very same thing, what we talk about. Let's discuss, bring in the better minds. Our digital audience is here. Uh, they are from all corners of South Africa with their expertise and just ordinary citizens wanting to know how do we get to that better place. Good to have you on the program as always. Let's go to Dr. Anthea first uh, from the Governing Body Foundation. Uh, Doc, uh, look, when, when you hear some of the stories that we've been uh, portraying over the past couple of weeks, you've seen these, these violent videos uh, going viral. Uh, what, what do you think is at the heart uh, of this violence in schools? Right. Uh, good evening. Good evening to everybody who's participating. What's at the heart of it is a, a society that is broken, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, and we look at the schools and schools are a microcosm of society. And what is happening in broader society is going to happen in schools. Mm. Uh, children are imitators. They will copy what they see in the community. And if they have uh, experiences in their households or in their broader communities that create the kind of stresses that get them to seek safety, they can expose that in the form of anger and aggression. Yeah. Or they could 
as some do withdraw or as some do that become uh, self-harmers right. so it's it hurts them psychologically so we have uh, i think we've talked about this for very many years now a wounded society it's not healed we have society that has experienced so much violence in the past and we haven't got past that and yeah. i don't think we can do anything with children if we don't yeah. start with adults first right. look you know and yeah. you i've heard already many people mentioning parents yeah. and the education policy says parents are primarily responsible for the discipline of their children so we do have to go to parents and we do have to uh educate parents we do have to teach them mm. how to get their children ready for school and the earlier we start doing better discipline in school yeah. the better we'll, we will be at the older age so when they get to these high schools already so much personal harm has been done um what we call adverse childhood experiences mm. or adverse community ex- experiences have had a huge impact on these children already right. and it comes out behavior is communication mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the emotions that are conveyed is information and we've got to get behind that yeah. behind that information they're trying to convey and try and work with that so, so, and this is beyond yeah. school so the big the, question uh, doc i guess is how do we teach our children as parents uh, empathy and perspective uh, uh, key issues. I just want to bring in our guests as we stand. It's called a hot change. We brought them on live on air. Uh, Elijah Mslanga from the De- uh, Department of Education. We also have Konani Fakude from uh, Satu, Teacher Union Satu, as well as Matekanye Matekanye, National Association of School Governing Bodies. Good to have you gentlemen on the program. Elijah, maybe first to you. Mm-hmm. Your department is tasked to formulate guidelines as well as policies in order to put paid to issues like what we're dealing with now. Yeah. What sort of policies are in place and why is it not working? Well, you see, a policy on its own, good evening, Blaine, a policy on its own is not good enough to make a change that is necessary, particularly when you are dealing with so- social matters. Mm. Uh, here you need a mindset change. You need behavioral change. So you need uh, to make sure that the um, the cultivation of those values is not only happening in school. Uh, if you want to focus on rules only, you are going to fail, and that's what we are seeing now. Yeah. So our standpoint is that uh, the, the home must teach, the school must reinforce, and everybody else in between must also play their part. Talk law yeah. enforcement, talk psychosocial support, talk all of those things. They need to work together. So the policies are there. I mean, the school safety framework is there, is in yeah. place. But it was from 2015, isn't yes, it? Yes, when you look at it, it calls on all, all of them. I think there's about 11 or so different stakeholders that must come uh, yeah. on board and everyone must play their part so that we're able to have this chain that is able to work together to ensure that change takes place. So, Kolani, what, what are the shortcomings of such a policy? It's there, it's being, it was rolled out from 2015, mm. the national framework in terms of safety. What are the shortcomings? Is there lack of implementation, lack of oversight, lack of evaluation? Because I understand you need a yearly survey mm. as well in mm. order mm. To, to recognize what are the, the problems there. Mm. What's happening at schools that is, it's not being affected? Let, let me greet you, Blaine. Let me greet also the, the, the viewers and the, the colleagues, the colleagues over here. The policies are there. Mm. The policies are very, very good. But yes, indeed, implementation is becoming a, 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 a weakness, a systemic weakness. But now I also want to also emphasize on one thing where also Elijah started from, mm-hmm. that it is all about taking responsibility, really, Blaine. You know, as such, we've got a campaign that we call the IMS School Fan mm-hmm. Campaign. It is all about really mobilizing all sectors of society, because education is a societal matter. What we all must agree on is that what is presented in the school by the learner, the behavior and so mm-hmm. forth, it is just a reflection of the very society mm. where our learners are, mm. where our, 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 our communities are, for instance. When we speak about violence in schools, mm. by the way, Blaine, it finds a space uh, to even um, um, uh, uh, be fertilized within the communities even before it goes to the school. So for us, what is important, it's all about taking responsibility. Mm. When we say that as a community member, you must worry about what is happening just down the road there. But then now we must ask ourselves a question as well as communities. 
when we do it against uh, service delivery issues, mm. what do we do? You go to a school, you close down a school, you leave the tavern next door. Mm. Now it tells you that as well we need a societal paradigm shift, and which is where we are. So mm. for us as a union, it's all really about taking responsibility, yeah. all sectors coming together. Mr. Matakanye, do you agree that <coughs> pupil violence in schools intersects with that pupil's community, broadly speaking? And if so, who, who should be putting up their hands in order to put pay to this? Is it parents, community leaders, government officials? Where does the, the blame lie? <laughs> Good evening, Pete, and uh, the viewers. Uh, firstly, it is historic. Mm. Uh, historic in the sense that now we are from the uh, violent past, if, if, if I to put that in that context. And uh, two is that uh, there are laws, as my comrades have said here, that uh, there are laws. I think when you look into South African School Act, Act number 84 of 1996, as amended, Section 8, Code of Conduct, Governing Body Responsibility. Mm. Section 8, capital A, search, seizure, and drug testing. Mm. Mm. The principal, and the, I think, in support of, in support of by the Department of Education. How often should that happen? Once you notice that there are queer behavior in school, then I think we just have to stand up and do that. Mm. Proactive. Yes, proactive. Mm. Uh, the, the, the principal uh, and the SMT mm. must make sure that uh, things are not well here. Right. These children are behaving uh, f funnily. So right. what we have to do is to search if they don't have power to do that, yeah. then they can invite the, the subs to, to help them. Like right. for instance, you know what happened? And it shows that uh, uh, there is no rule of law. In KZN, when police were called to search, mm. they found cell phones, pangas, guns, mm. drugs, and all those from 400, 400 learners. And what the learners did, mm. they reacted by burning down the school. Yeah. That is unacceptable. We mm. can't accept that. But it means that now they refuse the rule of law. Mm. So I think parents, we really just have, if we need a South Africa, a better South Africa, Parents, we just have to stand up and support, calling upon also the department so that officials must also uh, monitor schools. Right. Like, for instance, there's a school in Khalekstar. Mm -hmm. It has closed down. That thing is just like Izo Izo. You know Izo Izo. I don't know you know, yeah, you do. know, you know, you know <laughs> if you know Izo Izo. In Khalekstar, there's an Izo mm -hmm. Izo there. Mm -hmm. So we can't allow then that our children are going to school mm -hmm. and then from there just turn the school into yeah. a, a, a drug a drug smoking or a, right. a drug smoking area. Children can't learn if they are scared. Fear and anxiety. There's tremendous academic repercussions that stem from that. We're going to talk about more about it now. We're going to go to a digital audience. We need to take a quick break. Please engage with us at It's Topical SABC. 011-714-5958 is the number to dial. We'd love to take your calls. You can remain anonymous. If you have a story to tell us, please engage. Back next. Violence in schools, how do we stop it? What needs to happen immediately after an incident? But more importantly, what can we do to be more proactive in order to put paid to these acts before they happen? Question, let's take it to our digital audience and speak to Sebabatso uh, Tulo. She's a teacher as well as an author. Sebabatso, good to have you on the program and your perspective. When you hear, when you see these videos, what does it create in your mind? in terms of the fear that these children are going through, the anxiety that they're going through, and what needs to happen immediately in order to stop this? Um, so good, a very good evening to everyone. I think first thing, uh, it makes the job very scary, mm. if I'm being honest, because um, I think for, especially for young professionals going into the teaching sector, 
um, it makes it uncomfortable because you don't know what are you going to expect next. Mm -hmm. And the scariest part is the are the teachers protected enough as far as um, from the department side, Mm -hmm. you know, is we have all these policies which some of them just look good on paper as the conversation has already said is that um, it looks good on paper, but it's not yeah. really being implemented. And so it really does create a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety in a lot of teachers. And it also affects the quality of teaching that they can bring to the table, yeah. right? Um, in terms of, especially the schools that are situated in broken communities, as Dr. Empe has stated that every school will be a reflection of that community. Yeah. And I think when we look at how we can fix it or what should happen when we're fixing it, I don't think a um, one size fit all will work. Correct. Because I do really believe that when we're looking at how to assist schools, we should always pay attention to what's going on in that community. Yeah. We shouldn't treat all communities like they are the same. Yeah. And therefore we shouldn't treat all schools like they are the same, right? Yeah. Um, there may be certain elements that are similar, but different schools have to have a system that supports the environment that the school is in. And I really do believe that some of our issues um, happened when the department took away power from the schools, especially when it comes to um, um, processes like the expulsion of students, that it has to go through the department and things like that. And I do understand that maybe they want to try and remain um, neutral, but at the same time, the department is not at the school every single day. The department is not aware of what the situation is every single day. So I can really believe that some schools don't feel supported by the department. It was very heartbreaking, by the way, the video you played earlier, where the parent is actually saying, we ourselves don't know what to do with our children. Well, let's take, it, let's, let's take it to the department, the face of the Department of Education. Elijah, when you hear that in terms of the rules now that are set out in terms of expulsion, etc., what was the reasoning behind going to, down this route? The power is still with the school. It is the school that will hold a disciplinary process mm-hmm. against a learner that has offended. But uh, the school cannot expel. The school uh, will in recommend to the HOD in the province that that particular learner must be expelled because mm-hmm. expulsion is the last thing that you want to do. And as you expel, where is that young person going to? So the HOD still has a responsibility to find space for that particular mm-hmm. learner somewhere else. So mm-hmm. the, the school still has the power, but it does not have the final right. decision making. Pupils abusing teachers, uh, Koloni, uh, they can't hit back. Mm. whether it's physical or verbal. Um, So do they understand as teachers the systems that are in place that they can use in order to get some sort of recourse? Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, 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 in our view, uh, teachers are very much aware in terms of how they can deal with some of those challenges. Mm. However, the effectiveness thereof becomes the issue. For us, by the way, Blaine, and where we also want to hold the Department of Basic Education accountable, mm. is when we talk about psychosocial support services, for mm. instance. When we went to our Congress in 2019, <coughs> uh, we, we, we realized that from, the, from uh, uh, psychosocial support personnel, employed directly by the Department of Basic Education are extremely limited. Actually, at that time, in 2019, we're looking at around just below the number 2,000. Now, that is for 13 million learners. That is for just below 500,000 uh, education support personnel. Mm. Now, it tells you that we do have got a particular challenge, which is where we also would want to hold the Department of Basic Education accountable. When we speak about parental involvement as well, yes, as a teacher, I can know how to deal the number of steps that need to be followed. We also have got the National uh, uh, School Safety framework yeah. but now the problem with that national school safety framework is that is it implementable for instance we are right now sitting uh, with a, a, a department which is under some serious uh, resource constraints by the way because we are seeing austerity measures through the back door that is why we not we, we are having a uh, newly qualified teachers that are not even being absorbed by the system yeah. yet they are there so it means that when we say that education is an apex priority yeah. we then need to treat it like that both in action and otherwise it cannot just be well, about just a a, a a a policy issue elijah you can <coughs> respond to that is safety in schools an unfunded mandate what about psychosocial support um it's a societal matter uh, it is not a task that should be blamed or put on the door of one particular organization or entity uh, education the core mandate is curriculum implementation 
but we also, we also need to make sure that the environment is conducive for teaching and learning to take place. Yeah. So here we, we have to work together with the Department of Social Development, for example, when it comes to psychosocial support. We have to go there to draw uh, the resources that they have because it's not our core business, it's their core business, but as government, we need to work together. When it comes to law enforcement, we work with the SAPS and Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. So we work with other government uh, departments and yeah. agencies that help us get the job done. In this case, when it comes to violence, it also community-based organizations, parents that are there in the community that must come and play their part as well to expect right. education to solve all the problems. That's unrealistic. Look, I, I understand what Elijah is saying. Uh, it seems to say that everything is in place, just not being implemented. Mm. How do we fast track this? Because you can't have these visuals on our screens, on our phones, on our tablets, where children are beating up children. Mr. Matakani, what about teachers abusing <coughs> pupils? Uh, how prevalent is that in our schools? <coughs> Well, uh, I, I don't have exact the statistics. However, we know that uh, there are some schools where corporal punishment yeah. is occurring. Mm. Um, as much as there's still laws that pass teachers from, from beating up children, and uh, uh, it's still a problem. And then uh, I think also I indicated a question of uh, official monitoring. You see, the, the idle mind yeah. is the devil's workshop. Now, that will tell you that if these young people are in a school situation mm. where they will fight and well, it means, therefore, they were not doing anything. Yeah. They were not doing anything. So it is really upon us, probably, as, and I indicated very mm -hmm. clearly, because uh, it's the responsibility of the department to ensure that they, because the ideas are allocated schools, yeah. they must know quickly what is happening in the school. If there is no teaching, then the ideas must take it up. Let's, let's just talk uh, with regards to the idea, uh, idle minds. Uh, but I want to just zoom in on the story. Nazreen, I want to bring you in. Nazreen uh, Karim, I understand you, she's an occupational therapist. Quick story I heard uh, earlier this week. A friend of mine has an eight-year-old playing with another group of friends. I think there was a nine-year-old there as well. They were playing, had a bit of an argument. What, what, how serious can an eight-year-old argument be? The nine-year-old then got upset, went home, and brought a knife back. As he was walking towards the eight-year-old, an elder saw him, grabbed him. That could have been disastrous. What on earth goes through the minds of a nine-year-old that he thinks he needs to go get a knife to sort out this problem? You can unmute her, Nazreen. There you go. Oops, I think we're still having a bit of an issue uh, with regards to that. Uh, Nazreen, okay, let's, let's try to get Nazreen back on there. Uh, Kenny, you, you got your hands up. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Blaine. I believe this thing starts with the kind of movies that these kids are exposed to. Mm. You know, you find kids watching movies where in, like, other kids are stepping other kids. So as one, as someone said here, kids tend to imitate what they see. Mm -hmm. I believe the things that they are exposed to on a daily basis also has to do with these things. Mm -hmm. Another thing, most of these kids live in communities that are violent. So you see kids like witnessing other people being stepped from a young age. Like I come from a community whereby such things happen mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. However, other kids tend to grow and do those exact same things. So I believe it starts with what the kid is being exposed to. So if we can stop this sort of ex exposures and we also play a hand as a community, I believe that we can be able to solve these kinds of problems because it starts at home. Uh, Christine, to you, then to Zita. Christine is from UNICEF South Thank Africa. You. Yes, thank you. Good evening. And um, thank you for this very topical uh, conversation. I think building on what uh, others have said so far, it's really imperative um, that we bring life skills, uh, including respecting diversity, yeah. self-management, communication, resilience, 
you know, they need to be nurtured from a young age. Mm -hmm. And as many have said, it's not just about what happens at school. It's a, it's about what happens at home and in the community so that we can prevent and, and, and manage and overcome this violence that we're talking about. And I, I just wanted to underline uh, something that has been said before, also the, the importance of parenting programs. Uh, including positive discipline, because as we we just heard and we've heard uh, from from other uh, other panelists, what is positive d discipline? Uh, <clears throat> positive discipline is is not hitting, not going for the knife, not being violent, be it you know physically or um, or, or verbally. When there is a conflict, when there is tension in in the house or in the communities, is is resolving differences in a way that does not resort to to violence. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to also um, underline here, I'm conscious of the fact that many others want to speak. We need to engage fathers as well in the lives of their children, so that they are part also of this parenting and positive discipline that I'm talking about. Christine, thank you. Zita, to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think here yeah, the fundamental aspect, yes, just to revisit the policy framework legislation and the case law that has been provided a sufficient evidence to the Department of Education to say that the Department of Education, they must employ the social work. Remember the teachers which we are talking about now, they don't have fully knowledge about the psychological aspects of development of the child. But my question here is, how long should it take for the Department of Education to make such a recommendation? Because you should understand that such a document is submitted to the Department of, uh, of Education just to make a recommendation that the social worker should be brought into the to, to school. What I've seen on the video is just a dis disdain behavior by the child. Why? Because all these teachers we are talking about now, they don't have a full control to such a child. Reason being, they're not fully trained based on the social worker kind of. So my question is from Department of Education, are they all these policies in front of them? Are they paradox? Are they confusing? If not confusing, how long should it take for them just to implement that? That was the, my recommendation on that one. Zita, appreciate it. I'm going to get back to <coughs> Dr. Ngeva also. Nazreen, I, I noted you, Janelle. Uh, we will come back to you. We need to take a quick break. Also, Elijah noted that question from Zita as well in terms of training, uh, helping teachers understand better in terms of what goes on in the minds of these learners. Quick break. More next. Welcome back. We're talking about violence in schools here in South Africa. How do we stop it? Let me bring in our citizen journalism segment. It's a solution based. And I'm sure that's what we all want now, isn't it? To eradicate this violence. A group of that calls itself Fiela Movement is on a mission to help champion safety in Gauteng schools, often called to assist with searches. And the community initiative believes it takes the entire community to raise a child. It's as if kids have come to school to, it's a place to hang out and chill. And the sad thing about it is it's affecting education. There is a lot of bullying, substance abuse, um, drug abuse, and Ill, a lot of ill discipline. We are highly concerned. That's why we are here. That's why we've taken the initiative to say that we want to help where we can. Because at the end of the day, we, these are our future leaders. And that's why as Fiela Movement, we st stood up as well as part of a community initiative to say that it takes a community to raise a child. And it doesn't have to be my child that I gave birth to, but we have to help parents. <laughs> I think the biggest problem here we've got is uh, communication because now if we are able to estimate to say that example that there is a school that's in need 
talk to the community. Not everybody is going to be judgmental. We want to help. We not. It's not about who is better than who. Let leaders combine. It's not about politics. It's not about because my child is in Santin. It can happen in Santin. It can happen in Cape Town, and it's still happening. It doesn't have to be in a township for a problem for a school. So leaders need to put that pride aside. Let's work together and work to building a better foundation. Right. Let's further the discussion, take it straight to our digital audience. Let's try Nazreen Karim, uh, occupational therapist, once again. The norms and attitudes, uh, Nazreen, of the pupil. Is it fair to hold the parent exclusively responsible or the caregiver exclusively responsible for that? Or does society at large play a huge part? I would say it's definitely um, a, a case of both as well as mental health. And we find these mm -hmm. days that mental health is often very much overlooked within children, in young children particularly. So we find that kids are actually walking around with undiagnosed mental illness. And um, this can sometimes, if it's not diagnosed, in fact, according to South African Depression and Anxiety Group, um, they have found, based on studies, that yeah. Only 27% of individuals who have reported mental illness have actually been treated. So automatically one wonders about the rest. And we find that particularly learners who are suffering from mental illness are in turn drawn to substance abuse. Mm. And they end up using that mental instability which comes with that to actually satisfy the chemical imbalance, right. chemically imbalanced highs and lows. And it's not always and, and easy we, to, to pick that up, isn't it, on face value? Mm -hmm. To Zita's point, are teachers trained enough, or should they be trained, in order to pick up these, these issues? Absolutely. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we find that teachers are also quite vulnerable at this point. I mean, if we, we find that teachers themselves are afraid, and they're vulnerable mm -hmm. because they can't actually take any action. I mean... There are so many charges that get laid at teachers for yeah. the smallest reasons. And um, at the end of the day, there's also a lack of respect of children mm. towards teachers. And at the end of the day, um, teachers still have to show up. They still have yeah. to come to school and they still have to uh, be in control when they themselves are going through right. post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety and depression, just as the learners that are victim mm. to the bullying would be right. as well. Nazreen, thank you very much indeed. Faranaz, uh, Section 27, you have your hand up. Your comment or question? There we go, Faranaz. One more time. <laughs> Sorry, I muted and unmuted and muted again. Thank you very much for having me on your show and uh, good evening to all your other guests. Um, I agree with a lot of what's being said here, particularly Dr. Suresto mentioned mm. that schools are a microcosm of what's happening in broader society and the ills are multiple and the solutions have to be multiple. Mm. One of the things that we deal with at Section 27 is often when we get cases of um, uh, complaints of corporal punishment, um, often very violent corporal punishment, mm. and cases of sexual abuse. And for years in my work in education policy, we have pushed for protocols to be developed to, 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 to teach school communities how the processes that have to be followed, where there are complaints of corporal punishment or sexual violence. Um, these have only recently come into place. Yeah. At the same time, now that they are in place, what we are seeing is that these processes are not being implemented and enforced. And I'll give you an example of a very sad case. We had a case where um, a, 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 a handyman at a school, a school with, he was a school governing body appointment. Yeah. And um, he had raped a young girl who was 13 mm. at the time. It took us between five and seven years to eventually get a court order to say the school uh, governing body has to do something to get him off the school. In the meanwhile, other girls were also harmed, etc., etc. Did you say five to seven um, years? Did I hear that correctly? Five to seven years. I think it started in 2015, either 2015 or 2017. Yeah. It was only this year that we got a court order against the school. Yeah. And 
even after that court order, we had to ensure that that court order, order was being enforced mm. and that this man was then being um, subject to a disciplinary inquiry. Yeah. And one of the things that came up with the number of young girls that were harmed in the process. So it's not just uh, having these things, but it's making sure that our school management teams are committed to seeing these processes yeah. through. Consequences are that's, part of the uh, speed of process. Yeah. Definitely. Dr. Ngema, to you, then Bongiwe. And then Janelle. And, uh, thank, thanks for the opportunity um, and greetings to members of panel, colleagues, uh, and greetings to viewers at home. Um, uh, we, we are very much uh, excited to be part of this panel, and we are fresh from the conference as, as National Teachers Union, having deliberated uh, quite strongly on this subject uh, of uh, school safety uh, last week. And uh, we, we, we noted uh, the, the issue of, of uh, the lack of infrastructure in schools mm -hmm. uh, pertaining to issues of um, um, lack of fencing, proper fencing, which allows anyone mm -hmm. to just walk through the school without uh, uh, any um, hindrance. The issue of, of the appointment of, of trained uh, security officers, uh, the provision yeah. of, of, of resources, both human and, 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 and physical, um, we also deliberated on the issue, talking to the link of, of the SAPS to, um, to schools. Yeah. And we have the view that, uh, indeed, uh, uh, SAPS should do regular patrols to, to schools uh, during busy uh, times, um, uh, be it in the morning, during, during uh, prayers, also in the afternoon when the school uh, uh, closes. Right. Um, in, indeed, one cannot uh, uh, mention uh, any uh, stronger than the, the, what, what my colleague said earlier to say that we are, these learners are coming from broken society. Yeah. Uh, they are coming from child headed homes. Right. Discipline lacks from their homes. You yeah. see, so, so that's a problem. So it's a bottom up so from, uh, from, yeah. from, from, from where we sit as the National Teachers Union, we are calling for Indaba right. on this subject matter. Uh, in which all stakeholders, be it SAPS, the Department of uh, Education, SGPs, right. teacher unions, and everyone can bring uh, heads together to deal with this issue because we, we, we cannot reach and, 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 and come to um, the, uh, right. what we want to achieve. If Doctor, it should, 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 yes, we we'll have to pause it there. Thank you very much indeed for your time due to uh, time constraints. Bongiwe and then Janelle very quickly. So I want to speak on the issue of accountability. Right. We've spoken on policies that have been placed and policies that are good, yes, in, 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 on paper. However, where is the accountability? At what point does the department come in to actually implement this? Tomorrow being a Monday morning, what is the first step that the department is going to take to ensure that teachers are safe, mm. learners are safe in school? Because we are going to continue to have such conversations with no positive feedback from the department as to how these policies are going to be implemented. Right. We've been having these conversations. For instance, I run a program called Valley Teams. And here I've been speaking to different schools trying to figure out how we mm. can implement such policies. However, I haven't received positive feedback from any of the schools because they are waiting for the department. Right. So I just want to ask on the issue of accountability, please. All right. So, Bungiri, thank you very much indeed. Janelle? Um, good evening. Yes, we believe, um, and I've heard it from quite a few um, participants tonight, that the community is really the center of any society. And in in the society, we have quite a few communities. And once the community starts taking responsibility, the parents start taking responsibility for their homes, discipline in their homes, and circling it to the to the street, to the and then including the school and becoming part actively part and responsible in that school. We see that the parents and the communities are starting to build up yeah. that school. And when a parent starts building up with um, being part of the SGB, being part of the school governance, then we see parents taking this seriously and then starting to, to um, carry these right. values over to their children because it's really about carrying over values. And that we get in functional schools as well, where we have less of these problems is the, the value transfer. And um, where we have the socioeconomic problems, yeah. we see that when these communities start interacting, these mobilized communities with one another and saying, we have this challenge and the other community says, okay, we have that challenge. And they start looking at how 
um, they can find solutions and help each other. Yeah. Then we start then we start seeing a society where this interaction starts uplifting the the the, the bigger society and not just the community but you know a country as a whole but it starts in the community that is the very heart of where we should solve this problem Janelle, thank you very much indeed dr anthony i wanted to come to you but my director is like a, a school principal he's very strict so he's telling me to wrap <laughs> thank you very much indeed for everybody for your input value add indeed guests as always we will need to take the story forward as well can't be a once-off here's my take as journalists our job is to reflect the world we live in to mirror society. And at the moment, well, the reflection is giving many a community pause. Fighting, bullying, cyberbullying, gang violence. These acts don't only disrupt teaching and learning, it also has a negative effect on the broader society. You heard what our guests had to say, yeah. It has lasting harmful effects on victims and their families. So there's this dangerous ripple effect. Your children, my child, they have to have a right environment to feel safe and learn. We need to have clear eyes about this, the routes that we need to take, my brothers and sisters. There should be a sharp focus on prioritizing prevention strategies because children can't learn if they don't feel safe. If children feel safe, they can take risks, they can ask questions, they can make mistakes, they can learn to trust, share their feelings and grow. Author and lecturer in education and parenting, Alfie Cohn said that. So let's help them get to that better place that we always talk about by being more proactive. That's how we wrap things up. Until next week, take care. Bye-bye.